know the regain. Oh, that's so weird. So we always try to make sure that, you know, people can regain control of, of their own health. And in this case, their kids' health. Although, you know, this day and age, the parents' health as well. Um, and this class in particular um, will cover some basics, some common things that as kids are going back into school and especially in the, the age of COVID insanity, um, some unique things that maybe uh, kids will be dealing with just because they've been out of school for a whole year and masks, no masks, you know, somebody, you know, coughs and we all duck and cover under the tables. That's for the older parents. Um, nobody knows what duck and cover is anymore. The Cold War and all that. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, that's unfortunate. Kids shouldn't be stressed out going to school, but the reality is they are. Um, and certainly, you know, teachers are out, the kids are out. Um, you know, COVID is rampant right now in the schools and, and that's unfortunate and just the normal colds and flu crap. Uh, so we'll try to talk about all of that a little bit tonight. Um, and, you know, one of the things, uh, and I was a strange child, I'm a strange adult. Um, so uh, <laughs> as a strange child, going back to school was always really stressful for me. I was the weirdo. And so I think a lot of times we forget and the role that stress has uh, for kids going back into school, if they're going from elementary to middle school, middle school to high school, stress becomes a, a very strong component. And also if folks have been off for the summer, they're on a different sleep schedule and all of a sudden new sleep schedule, trying to talk about those kinds of things a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to cover all of that. And I got a few, Renee made the PowerPoint. So I'm like, I recycled the, or I moved them all around to fit my brain space. Um, and I've got a few others that will, will, I'll sneak some other ideas in. And I did, oh, I really like talking about plants that are either already growing in your yard um, or that are very easy to grow. So I'm going to try to incorporate some of our local little fun weeds uh, or things that mm -hmm are easy to grow here um, into what we talk about a little bit. And if I didn't say it, I'm Bob. I'm one of the directors of the Traditional School of Verbal Studies for all you newbies. Um, I think uh, Trisha will be sending out a recording for everybody who signed up. And um, I'll upload this to YouTube since it's one of our free classes. So if for some reason you don't get it, it'll be on YouTube. If you haven't found us on YouTube, check out Tradition School of Verbal Studies. Yay, more people coming. Uh, and you can find all kinds of other insane things, uh, open forum um, and so forth. We've got, for any of you who haven't checked out our stuff, we've got a slew of classes coming up, free, not free. Uh, the Western Herbal Program uh, is starting, which is from beginner to uh, clinician. And the Chinese Herbal Program, my personal favorite, uh, is coming up in November as well and uh, is also a two-year uh, clinical program. So, you know, feel free to give a call, schedule an appointment or something if you're like, I don't know what the heck to do um, or which one's the right one. And we'll kind of walk you through the process. Of course, you should do all of them. And there's a bunch of classes. There's Thursday and Friday night classes uh, that'll kind of help you get your feet wet with a variety of our different teachers here. So I hope y'all check out the website and find cool stuff to take besides this class. So, I'm going to, so this class is an interesting one because um, it's more, when we talk about herbs uh, here in, in class, we're oftentimes, we talk about energetics, we talk about formulation, um, we look at constitution and longer term care, and that's awesome if you want to be a clinician, but sometimes acute care is really important, and one of the things we always like to, to talk about, we talk about this in the 101 class a lot, that if you not if you don't have any medical training whatsoever, you could go down to CVS right now and you could treat a wide variety of, of diseases. You could go and, and treat some minor wounds. Hey, <laughs> everybody's online, so it's just us here. <laughs> I got, I got a million people online and, you know, just the cool kids are here in person. Um, so with CVS, you could constipation, diarrhea, uh, minor injuries, insomnia, colds and flu. There's like 
you wouldn't ever consult a medical professional. You could go in there and figure it out. Well, what do we do before CBS? Promise, we had all the same ailments and there was nobody to go to. There wasn't that corner store. If we go back a hundred years, especially if you weren't in a major metropolitan area, there was no store to go to that was the, the uh, CVS or something similar. And so what it was is people knew what to do. And every mother, every grandmother knew those plants that grew around them to help with their minor issues, whether it was colds and flu, digestive upset, sleep, those you could either find at the, the local farmer's market or you would have it growing yourself or it was a weed that was already there. And we've lost that. Uh, and, and so one of the goals and the reason we do the free classes, besides it's good marketing, uh, <laughs> one of the goals is we should be able to not rely on doctors for our minor issues. We shouldn't even be able to have to rely on CVS. You know, we live on the Florida. A hurricane comes through and our junk gets knocked out for two weeks from a major hurricane. CVS isn't open and you can't get there anyway. So what do you do? You're still going to be catching colds and minor sprains and strains. And if we don't have some level of understanding and control of those things that literally are already in your yard, you're screwed. So we want to unscrew people. <laughs> um, so it, it's, in this case, I'm gonna, rather than sit here and, and babble endlessly about what a challenge going back to school is ever. Um, I hated school by the way, and you know, I keep going back anyway. I love learning, I hate school, uh, go figure. <laughs> um, I'd rather kind of just go through the Medica and talk about some really common combinations of either herbs that grow here and how to use those or um, ones that are pretty easy to source. Uh, and yeah, before I delve into that, probably the hardest thing with herbal medicine, um, and although adults are going back to school too, um, uh, kids always aren't always keen on taking nasty tasting herbs. Um, and so that is one of the biggest challenges uh, is if you didn't raise a child on, um, it's so funny, uh, acupuncturist used to work with me um, and she had a kid at six months old, started feeding that kid tinctures and really nasty combinations of the herb. And because it wasn't presented as, let me put the kid in a headlock and start forcing the medicine down their throat the way, like I, this never happened to me as a child, but I hear they strap children to a board now in order to give them immunizations and others. What a horrifying, you know, introduction to Western medicine. Um, <laughs> I, I, that kid's going to be in counseling for a long time. Um, and so how, how do we get the herbal medicine into the kids in a way that doesn't cause more trauma than they're already in? And the, there's a number of tricks, obviously, uh, to doing this, but a lot of it is our attitude. Like, shut up and eat your vegetables. You can't leave the table. That's why, why we use food as punishment. We use medicine as punishment in the same way, and especially if I need them to drink something that maybe isn't yummy. Um, and, and it's funny, our, our taste receptors in our mouth change as we age. Um, when people are little kids, they have more bitter taste receptors. And so you hated broccoli when you were four and you spit it out. That was a safety mechanism. So the idea is like little kids pick up everything and put it in their mouth and bitter things were oftentimes poisonous. <laughs> and so if you have a hyper response to putting something bitter in your mouth, you're more likely to spit it out. So it's literally a survival mechanism that we have this ship. And then oh, I used to hate broccoli, but now I can't stop eating it because the way our taste receptors respond in our body have changed because now presumably we know what poison is, although I seem to regularly poison myself, but whatever. Uh, so the idea is there are many of our best herbs, especially for cold and flu, taste like crap. They're, they're very acrid, they're strongly aromatic, they help us break a sweat. We'll talk about that more as we go. Um, and so finding ways to put them in, um, was it Mary Poppins? You know, a little bit of sugar helps the medicine go down. So that plays a role. I would not suggest sugar, I prefer honey. Um, honey is also a cough suppressant. 
So adding a little bit of honey to the medicine is got a therapeutic effect to it, um, doesn't uh, create the diabetic coma that massive amounts of sugar will do. Um, there's other options. I don't, I think we should taste our herbs in all their glory, but that takes a process to get your kids to that point. Um, but you can use glycerin, uh, which I find absolutely disgusting, but it's because it's hyper sweet. I generally don't recommend artificial sweeteners or other natural sweeteners like stevia. Unless you have a stevia plant that you pick a leaf off of and put it in there, it's not your friend. I, I, I had a discussion with a, a client the other day. She was like, can I put stevia in it? And I was like, are you growing it? She's like, no. And she was adamant that she only wanted natural products. She wasn't going to do anything chemical. Didn't want to do anything Western. I was like, how did you get that liquid stevia? That is not a tincture. They literally use chemicals to extract and concentrate the stevia to make it this room temperature stable thing, most of which is using carcinogens in order to create it. I was like, nah. So honey is a very natural product. <laughs> it's a fairly sustainable. We have a, a plethora of bee farmers in this area. So you can even get some local honey um, and generally very safe. There's a question of using uh, honey for very young children. Um, after four years old, I don't even think twice about it. So you can use the uh, glycerin for the much younger children if you need to. Um, you can also mix it with food and hide it in there. We'll look at a couple of good examples. And so pesto is a wonderful place to hide all kinds of nasty, disgusting things. Soups and stews are a great place to hide things. And for uh, infants, if you're still breastfeeding, um, you can actually either the mom can drink it and it's brought in through the breast milk, or actually, uh, whilst the kid's breastfeeding, you can actually drip, drip the herbs, either a, a tea or a decoction or even a tincture down the breast. Um, and it'll mix with the breast milk and usually pretty um, acceptable to the, the little ones if you need to do that. Um, yeah, that's enough of that. Let's talk about herbs. I'm just gonna talk about herbs all night. So I'm gonna have way too much fun with it. Um, if, assuming that I can do this. So. Astragalus, you know, one of the things, there's two different ways when we think about back to school and colds and flu, and, and a good chunk of this will be talking about colds and flu. One is treatment, like, ah, crap, I caught a cold, you know, and, and we've all been in isolation for a year or so, haven't been interacting with kids, you know, the kids haven't been interacting with each other. So all of the colds and flu and viruses and bacteria that have been hanging out that normally you would get exposed to throughout the school year. Now you're going to get hit with a year and a half's work all in one fell you know, week. Um, so ensuring that we have a healthy immune system going into it, uh, you know, an ounce of prevention and all that uh, is probably one of the more beneficial things. And astragalus is pretty high up on my list of this is good stuff. Generally considered safe. It has a positive role in uh, white blood cells. Um, I've seen its benefit on leukocytes, white blood cells in general. Um, it seems to, and we'll look at a, a classical formula or combination with astragalus in it, um, in helping to minimize the severity and frequency of colds and flu. Um, it doesn't taste horrendous. The downside of this is it's a root. And so it's a fairly fibrous root that you can't make tea out of. You stick that in a cup of tea, it isn't gonna do a thing. Um, so this has to be boiled, so decocted. Sorry, I'm using both words. Some of you know stuff, some of you may not know stuff. So pardon me while I use less technical terms like boil the crap out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, will not, you will not diminish the benefits of this by using heat. So some herbs like a mint will be destroyed if we boil the crap out of it. All the good volatile oils that we want are going to be evaporated off. With this, there's no volatile oils. It's not a stinky plant. It's probably about as benign as you want. If you boiled it for an hour, you'd get this slight yellow tinge to the water. So very, very 
hard part and, and very subtle. My favorite thing to do th with this is to put it in soup. Soup, stews, if you're doing bone broth, this is probably one of the best additions you can put in there. Um, I can't think of a single reason not to give this to people. Um, even though I, I, I said it has a positive benefit on the white blood cells and on the immune system, um, we use this you know, for, for technical folks and, and you know, I, I'll go down far down the rabbit hole as you want. Um, it, it helps with things like the CD4, CD8, um, that it'll raise those levels. Um, it has, there's some good research about it for T killer cells. Um, and just literally the speed of our body's immune system uh, to respond for a viral or bacterial attack. It does not seem to aggravate autoimmune disorders, which is super important. So we're like, yay, we're going to school. We're, we don't want to get sick. We're going to do all these things that say immune booster on it. Well, if your immune system is already hyperactive, an autoimmune disorder, and there are many, <laughs> we have to be cautious with those. And, and we're going to talk about one here in a couple of slides. So astragalus does not seem to have a negative effect on autoimmune disorders. And it doesn't say it on here. If any of you are cool Chinese, well, I know we got uh, Martina on here, so I'll say Chinese stuff too. Um, this is Huang Qi. Uh, this, it's a Chinese herb that's very common for us to use um, for any kind of Qi deficiency. And it's the exact same one. Westerners stole this from us. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, this, I have not had any success growing here. It needs a little bit more cold uh, in order to be successful. So like zone nine north, you can grow this. So Gainesville north, you could probably get away with growing this. Um, I know for sure, Georgia, there's people growing it. Very common to grow in uh, North Carolina. Someone raised their hand. On oh, ask away. I didn't see it. Uh, okay, you can unmute yourself if you'd like. I can unmute. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. I have a question in regards to astragalus. I have heard different things that you should take it up until you get sick. And then I have heard that you should take it while you're sick. And I have heard that you should not take it while you're sick. Okay. So what's the answer? Thank you. Yes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's funny. Opinions vary. And I won't say any of them are wrong. So it goes back to Chinese medicine, honestly. Um, in Chinese medicine, we, once you get sick, we call this a wind invasion. So it, we, we say some crazy stuff in Chinese medicine. Um, oh, I'm gonna go so far down the rabbit hole. Oh, you opened up a can of worms, you're in trouble now. Um, so, I'm gonna say insanity and I apologize. So this is Chinese medicine 101. This is your skin and hopefully, yeah, you guys can see that. This is your skin and these are your skin pores. Oops, helps if I know how to spell. Um, I am not an artist, so I apologize in advance. So, and this is kind of the next couple of slides and, and this is all gonna make sense, promise. I'm going a long way around. In Western herbal medicine, if you catch a cold, we do what's called diaphoresis. We give you a bunch of herbs that make you break a sweat. And we don't really ask whether you have a fever or not, but we see that with fevers a lot. It's like, oh, I was sweating, I had a fever and then my fever broke. We were sweating and now we stopped. And now we're like on the mend and we're getting better. Every traditional culture uses the act of sweating to get rid of colds and flu, except they don't use that language. And I forget where you're from, right? My family's from. Okay. So uh, they probably use something similar, mal air, the bad air. Um, I know in South America, we talk about uh, the cold air, the evil air okay. is all part of that language. In um, Chinese, we call it xie qi. This is evil qi. And this is the wind. We say disease travels on the wind. 
and it invades through your skin pores. We call them ghost gates, so we're extra cool. Uh, <laughs> and your immune system, in Chinese, we call the Wei Qi. And so chills and fever is the Xie Qi, evil Qi, and the Wei Qi, the immune system, doing battle. And our hope is, is that our immune system pushes out the wind, the evil, and we can assist that by using herbs that make you sweat. And we're gonna look at a couple of those herbs that are very common for that. And so now I'm gonna come back around to the idea here. The reason, like the Chinese break their own rules. The Chinese would say never use a, a nourishing herb, right? And astragalus is a nourishing herb, it nourishes the body. We say it strengthens the energy or the chi of the body. It works specifically on the immune system, the Wei Qi. And so if you're sick and you trap that in the body, now you'll never get well. You'll be sick for all eternity. And so the Chinese will say, never use astragalus while you're sick. The reality is that we break our own rule all the time. There's lots of formulas where as long as we have herbs that make you break a sweat in a higher amount than the astragalus, you're allowed. And there are some classical formulas that do that. So yes, you can use astragalus both to strengthen the immune system. And one of the formulas we'll look at uh, towards the end of this um, is uh, three herbs together that are specific for strengthening those skin pores to protect your exterior from attack. Um, astragalus being the primary herb in there, the chief herb in that. And we can change the ratio of those herbs or add herbs like elderberry or yarrow um, in order to make it stronger for letting out the colds and flu to make you sweat, diaphoresis, release exterior for the Chinese. Um, so it's about the combination of how and when and why you use the astragalus. So I would say it's always good. Yeah. So like from a Western verbal perspective, would you consider this a tonifying herb, like something yes. you could drink all the time? So it, it's so funny, and, and yeah. you, you're, yes, 100%. Okay, because okay, I've learned that way. <laughs> but so uh, the, um, in Chinese medicine, we call it a tonifying herb, okay. 100%. And you're gonna, I'm gonna say for the Western herb students, tonifying herb is one that tightens the tissues. And so I use nourishing in lieu of tonifying, okay, but they're the same damn thing. Okay. <laughs> so it's just specific, specific. Yeah, specific. and so you could drink this all the time. Yeah, you're you're not going to hurt yourself, and don't do high dose long term of anything. Right. Um, you know, use it for a specific purpose. I have I don't think maybe in a thousand people I saw one headache. We say it has an upward energy, so it tends to go up. Um, there's caution sometimes with high blood pressure. I've never seen an issue. Yeah. So if you've got the hot energy and the cold energy fighting, yeah. um, what does breaking a sweat do? So the, the assumption is, is the wind has made it inside the, the skin. Mm -hmm. And so we vent it, we chase it out. Oh, so sweating is seen as venting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know, it's, it's some crazy ideas yeah. we have. Um, I don't think it's great. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you what, I, I biochem major originally, very science minded in my thought process. Ah, screw that. And germ theory is real. We do have bacteria. We do have viruses. We have funguses and all that. But I used to always, when it came to colds and flu, I was like, oh, here's this formula. I'm just going to take this. It's a good antiviral. I must be catching the flu or something, right? I did this this one time. It was really funny. Um, the andrographis is the formula that's phenomenal antiviral anti-everything makes antibiotics work better it's crazy um, i don't have a slide for that but we'll get a chance we'll talk about that so i always in my head is like oh catching a cold you know and i'd better go take that because it kills everything and i had been teaching all weekend and so you know you get run down you eat crap i was you know teaching yeah, eight nine hours a day mm -hmm. and i had uh my chinese students were graduating that night so Sunday rolls around and I'm like, all right, I got to run to the store and get some snacks. So we have snacks for graduation. And uh, I'm sitting there in the checkout line in Publix going, 
And I, I so clearly remember, this was 15 years ago, I bet. I remember clearly saying to, to the woman at the checkout line, I was like, how can you stand it? It's so cold in here. And I was like, literally like shivering. And I was like, wow, you know, I am a little run down. So I started taking this andrographis uh, pedicularis formula. And um, you see the graduation pictures, all the students are like, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and I, even though, like, sorry, desert storm vet, compromised immune system from all the burning oil wells and stupid immunizations and stuff like that. And so um, I have chronic sinusitis, thanks military and, and a few other minor issues. And I'm rarely sick for more than 24, 48 hours. Like I take my herbs, I'm good. Some vitamin C, a couple of herbs, piece of cake. I was sick for days. Monday rolled around, I canceled my patients. A week went by, I had canceled my patients. And I was wavering and out, you know, ended up taking over the counter kind of crap, which I don't like taking that stuff. And um, I finally, after two weeks and just feeling like a train wreck and just kind of dragging through my day, I was like, I got to, so I went to go see that, an herbalist acupuncturist that I respected and just like could barely think. And uh, she, she's no longer in the area. She was hilarious. She laughed at me. It's like, <laughs> She's like, dumbass, why did you take that? And she gave me a formula within 24 hours of the correct formula. I felt great back on top of the world. And so with the bad air, right? With this evil wind, we put other pathogenic factors with that. We put the idea, you can have wind and cold, wind and heat, wind and damp and a calm and phlegm. Uh, and we can combine all of them together. So you can have, and, and think about it, some people get a high fever. Some people don't get a high fever. Some people have a snot fest going on and others don't. Um, and so the uniqueness of each disease and how it manifests in our body will determine the herbs that we put in there rather than saying, you have a virus, here's all the antiviral herbs. Why doesn't that work every time? So selecting the right plants to put those together to address the way that disease was manifesting. What were you using at the bar? I was using a bunch of cold herbs. And remember I said I was really yes. cold? I made it worse. Yeah. I see. Okay. And it didn't work. And so as soon as I switched to warm release uh, diaphoretic sweating herbs, literally in 24 hours, I was perfect. So you were feeding. Was and it, it wasn't, it was actually, I guess, yeah, it was actually feeding it and pushing it in in some way. So it, it's funny and I have never, I, I have, I've come close to making that mistake again, but now I'm like, oh no, how do I feel? What symptoms do I see? Is the lung chunks that I'm coughing up, are they green, yellow, white, or clear? Or is my, are my boogers, you know, varying colors? Those things that are yellow, stinky, sticky, those are hot. Things that are white or clear, uh, more fluid, tend to be more cold. I tend towards cold as a constitution. So you would balance the opposite. There you go. If you're too hot, cool off. If you're too cold, eat them up. So it's an interesting concept. Sorry, I said I wasn't going to do energetics, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help myself. That's advanced. And is there, uh, oh, I see Ayurvedic words. Okay, good. <laughs> so astragalus is um, nourishing, totally fine, uh, slightly warm and um a little dry and i argue with david winston about this all the time he says it's moistening i say it's drying so we'll settle on neutral slightly dry david winston he's a friend yeah i i like david um and, and so we argue a lot <laughs> no we've had him down here i i've mowed i've mowed his lawn uh, <laughs> um and uh it it is, and the important thing to remember, it does have this slight upward energy to it, which is really unique. And that kind of guides it to the exterior of the body. Elder, this is a Florida native. It's a everywhere native. <laughs> There's, oh God, yeah. Like in St. Pete? Yeah. Literally, it's, it's a weed. We've got some growing back here. It's all over Boyd Hill. Most of the parks have it. Um, it usually grows in marshy areas. It likes wet feet. Um, 
There's a lot of folks putting out information about using the uh, roots, barks, and leaves. Please do not do that. I think it's irresponsible to put that kind of information out. There is a toxicity um, to any of the leaves, barks, and roots. Um, the only part anybody should be using is the fruit. And you can see the kind of uh, black purpley fruit there. Um, and the flowers. And they have a slightly different function to them. We generally look at the flowers uh, as I think one of the best um, diaphoretic, make you sweat herbs. It, it is like, I'm, I feel like I'm catching a cold or something, I'm grabbing some elderflower. Like, don't even think about it. Then you can decide what to add with it. Um, the fruit does a better job at helping to uh, strengthen the immune system. So um, people will make the elderberry syrup and it'll be a combination of herbs. That's made with the fruit, not the flowers generally. Low dose flowers can also be used for um, uh, sinus issues, um, allergies, red tide. <laughs> <laughs> It may not be my my go-to for red tide, but it doesn't hurt. It helps at red tide. Yeah, it'll help with red tide. That's a type of wind invasion. <laughs> yeah, now we'll look at some other herbs that are better. Um, opinions vary about its effect on the uh, autoimmune disorders. I've not seen it have an adverse effect on autoimmune disorders. Um, I've seen reports of it. Uh, there's also a lot of I'm going to say bad information, but there is uh, some, it depends on who you read, uh, that it will help create the cytokine storm, which is the big scary with things like COVID. Um, sorry, I'm saying medical words. Uh, <laughs> so when so you're what, 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 cytokines, what, 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 a cytokine storm. So when you see people who are ending up uh, intubated and in the hospital with COVID, just because it's you know, current and relevant. A lot of times what that is, is their immune system has hyper responded. Um, and our body, you know, the reason our eyes swell up and fluids come out of various parts of our face is our body trying to get, do its good job. Like the virus doesn't do that, the immune system does. not um, And so if it hyper does it, and then our lungs swell up until with fluids, and next thing you know, you're on a, a ventilator. So that's been one of the issues um, with COVID in particular. And there's been concern sometimes with herbs that they may hyperstimulate the immune system. And one of the herbs that was implicated in that was elder. Really? I've never seen it. I thought it was again another tonifying herb. Oh God, no, definitely not. Definitely not. No, and the flowers, definitely not. The fruit, you could argue it a little bit. I would say it is um, helps to nourish the immune system, but the flowers are a diaphoretic antimicrobial uh, without a doubt. And you should not take flowers long-term. That should be short-term. If you're taking it more than a week, stop. Like it. it my formula yeah i wouldn't do the flower there's so many better herbs that you could use okay, uh, the fruit you could get away with it um the and you know yes harvest yourself make sure you're doing good plant id go on a plant walk watch a video don't trust the plant apps um the only thing that's ever so slightly look alike to the berries is poke i don't think they look anything alike <laughs> But I've seen people make that mistake. Poke is poisonous, so please don't make that mistake. Um, and poison hemlock, uh, water hemlock, ever so slightly looks like elder leaf. And so uh, make sure you're doing good plant ID with it. I think it's very easy to tell. Um, there are. It's funny, I like to go canoeing on the uh, Hillsborough River, and I found water hemlock there once. I went to 
oh, another river down south. Uh, uh, maybe it was the Little Manatee, I think. And I hadn't been on that in a million years. We, we paddled right from the very start of it almost and paddled uh, like six miles down there. Every inch of it was covered with water hemlock. I was like, I'm in poison heaven. <laughs> so, and I still didn't think it looked anything alike. Um, but the water hemlock tends to grow in the water. Elder tends not to grow in the water, but they both, one grows more near the water. That said, if the water level goes down, your water hemlock's on land, so eh, be careful. And it will poison you badly, go to the hospital <laughs> if you get it wrong. As a general rule, I, and I break this rule all the time, I've eaten handfuls of fresh elderberries. Um, I won't say they're yummy, but they're okay. Um, they do have cyanotic glycosides in there, which is fancy talk for cyanide um, in small amounts. And it is basically chemically changed to not be scary if you heat it. So generally you should cook your elderberries or use a hot water tea infusion with the flowers. That's the reason why we say don't use the leaves, the bark or the root, because the concentration is significantly higher enough to do harm. It's considered a, a medium toxicity plant, except for the berries and flowers. Maybe a, not for this meeting, but I'm just wondering if there's a if, there, if there's been a COVID caution. Kinda. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to talk supplements towards <laughs> the end, so I'll I'll say words because obviously, eh, COVID's here. It sucks. <laughs> I hate masks. I wear the hell out of mine. <laughs> hell, I'm talking behind plastic here. <laughs> That's it. Um, so yarrow is, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, a magical plant. Uh, <laughs> this is um, phenomenal physical medicine, phenomenal spiritual medicine, um, and magical medicine. Uh, this is another release exterior diaphoretic make you break a sweat herb. The flower specifically is good for that. I think uh, it is a phenomenal combination with elderflowers. And I'll give you my magic formula here when we get towards the end of it. Um, so the, the flowers are best uh, for making you sweat. The leaves are styptic. That's just fun to say. Uh, <laughs> um, it's fancy talk for make you stop bleeding <laughs> um, and it can be used topically to stop bleeding as well as internally um, it's also highly antimicrobial there's an, uh, a lot of volatile oils in it so if you had something you didn't want to get to infected it's actually a benefit to either use fresh or dried yarrow leaf on it and the roots have a uh, pain-killing property as well as antimicrobial. So <clears throat> stripping the, uh, using fresh root is best. You can grow this here, it's not native. Um, but if you strip the, the dirt or the outer bark off, it's specific for tooth infection. So chewing it up and then like putting a little pinch between the cheek and gum, uh, not only will it help with the infection, it will also help kill the pain. So until you get to a dentist kind of thing, um, it's phenomenal. I separated out those plant parts because they are best for each one of those things, sweating, stop bleeding, infection, and kill pain. All of it does all of it. So like, I don't have a root. All I got is some dried flowers. Well, you know what? Put those dried flowers by your infected tooth. It will have benefit. It will kill the pain, just not as good as the root. You wanna, you know, all you've got is the flowers grind them up and put them in a cut it will stop the bleeding uh, there's not a question it's just super cool when you can make it work twice as good because you got the right plant part this is used and has nothing to do with you know children going back to school uh <laughs> but i like to talk about yarrow it's so cool um the roman soldiers uh going into battle would take yarrow leaves and stuff them up the nose for two reasons one it stops bleeding and you're sitting there swinging swords and whatever, it's a good chance you're gonna end up with a bloody nose out of it. Um, but it also keeps the dead away. And so um, the idea that people who die a violent death, think Roman soldiers in wartime or any old good wartime, um, people don't even know that they've died. 
And from a spiritual standpoint, sometimes that's where we get ghosts from. That's where we get spirits coming around it. Like literally like what happened? I, I'm not supposed to be dead and they don't understand it. Um, and so Yarrow is used to keep them away from you and keep them from following you home. <laughs> And um, Renee, Renee tells the story better than I do, but mine's a shorter version. Um, she had a friend who also happened to be an herbalist who was a paramedic and nothing like a paramedic sitting there literally doing CPR on somebody when they pass. And they found a lot of the paramedics were like, something came home with me today. <laughs> and I didn't want that company. <laughs> And so they used a uh, yarrow uh, infusion with a little salt and they would spray each other down with it and they would spray the, the bus with uh, the, the ambulance or the, the paramedic vehicle down with it um, in order to keep that yuck coming home from them. And we've used this frequently when somebody got in a car accident and somebody died, um, when somebody stopped to render aid, not a paramedic, uh, anybody who's been exposed to death and feels a little creeped out and it lingers, um, this is your friend. <laughs> <laughs> and that can be sprayed on you, beaten with it, drink it, it doesn't matter, take a bath with it, it's all good. Ah, we sure somebody's gonna cause a ruckus on that. <laughs> no, I so I call wayward spirit. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of ways to, to yeah, describe yeah. it. Um, they're not malevolent. They're not meanies or anything like that. They're just kind of like, what the hell happened? <laughs> they don't understand yet. So chamomile is the probably. I I hope all of you study lots of herbs and have a whole herbal pharmacy at home, but most people don't. But most people have chamomile. You can go to 7-Eleven and buy chamomile. You can go to Publix and buy chamomile. And this is such a versatile herb. Um, and for everything from infants to dogs and cats to people, uh, to adults, um, that we can use this uh, for stress, to help with sleep, to help with digestion, especially when there's bloating, helps with gas, flatulence. Um, it can help with spasmy pain, colic. It is diaphoretic, it helps you break a sweat. Um, it's an ophthalmolic, which it's good for the eyes. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, it can be used topically and internally. So the Chamomile, yes. A small number of people don't like chamomile will make them itchy. Anything in the aster plant family has the potential to cause some allergies. I think I've seen it once, in which case I didn't give it to them anymore. Found something else that wasn't an aster. Um, if you're like, oh, I love chamomile tea. It's so sweet. It's, if you didn't know it, it should be sweet and fruity. If it's not, you have crappy chamomile. Um, chamomile is a phenomenally sweet, fruity smell. And in a short infusion, i.e. less than five minutes steeping in hot water, it will be sweet and fruity in its flavor. That's lovely as an after dinner, settle your stomach kind of thing. That is not strongly medicinal. If you want to be knocked unconscious, if you have painful cramping spasms, if you want to release uh, you know, the, the evil wind, uh, if, if you, it does lots of wind from either end, uh, <laughs> uh, you have to do a lot of it and steep it a long time so that it tastes like holy hell. It will be thick, dark, resinous, and bitter. And so my magic formula for, holy crap, I think I'm going to be really sick. And, and for real, these are my measurements. A handful of elderflower, a handful of yarrow flowers, and a handful of chamomile flowers. I throw them in a French press. I may throw some other stuff in there, pour some hot water on it, and then I go do something. Come back an hour or so later. and 
drink it until like I'll do like a half a cup with a hat on long sleeve shirt wrapped in a blanket until I sweat and if you need to do four cups of it so be it until you break a sweat and I'm gonna say 80% of the time you'll wake up fine in the morning and you'll be unconscious you'll have the best night's sleep ever you'll like pass out and then wake up 10 hours later set the alarm if you need to go to work <laughs> um that yeah you can reheat it or you can just leave it on the counter um i don't even worry about it being that hot um we had a friend of ours um he was actually in our intern clinic if you don't know it we have an intern clinic three nights a week both herbs and acupuncture uh, acupuncture is on monday nights and herbs are three nights on monday tuesday wednesday um our students get in practice torturing people <laughs> <laughs> for the third one yarrow chamomile and elder flower. flower yeah flower on all of those okay. um equal amounts basically and you can fiddle with the amounts if you want but i usually just throw it in there <laughs> um yes. the we had this one friend it was very odd um had uh, ovarian cancer and, and there's so many levels of odd to this um uh transgender female to male and still had uh ovaries and so ended up with ovarian cancer and that's really important when you're working with any of the transgender community um and he came to us with some abdominal pain and um like like there's something wrong sent him to the hospital they sent him away <laughs> thought he was drug seeking these, these stupid doctors uh <laughs> sent him back the next day because i was like no there's something seriously wrong and they found that he had ovarian cancer uh, or yeah, ovarian cancer. And when they went in to explore it, they found that the ovary had flipped over the one with the cancer on it and it had cut off the blood supply and actually killed the cancer. It was probably a stage two or three cancer. And so I just thought it was fascinating that somebody who was transgender literally killed the reproductive female organs. Right. <laughs> it was like, it saved, great. it saved his life. Yeah, amazing. And, and so went and did, went out to Colorado. We had a, a friend out there and did surgery, I think he did chemo, and smoked a lot of weed um, to help him through the chemo. It has benefits for cancer and so forth. Um, and the first day I think he got back, maybe a couple of days he'd been back, we get one o'clock in the morning. He's like, the cancer's back, I'm dying. And we're like, take a deep breath, do you have a fever? You know, we ran through a quick checklist of, you know, do you, do you need a Valium or do you need to go to the emergency room? And um, the problem was he had no more cannabis. So he didn't have the benefits of the relaxation and so forth. His friend was a good cook and they ate the finest food and all organic. And he got back and probably ordered pizza. Um, and so the anxiety ramped up for the lack of cannabis and really poor food choices. He had a lot of abdominal pain and you know now the anxiety so we're like all right take a deep breath we're not bringing you anything i don't think you have it what herbs have you got in the house and he had a box of chamomile we're like take all of the chamomile that's in the little tea bag throw it into a pot of water bring it to boil let it sit there for 30 minutes and drink as much as you can without exploding we kind of got freaked out this was one o'clock in the morning right and we're like let us know if there's you know this doesn't help nine o'clock the next morning we hadn't heard from him and we're like, oh crap, you know, 18 hours later, and we're like ready to start banging on the guy's door. He, he calls us, he was like, I passed out. He literally slept for 18 hours from a strong batch of chamomile. So <laughs> set your alarm. It should taste like shit, bitter, viscous brown. Is there a German chamomile too? Yes, they're Egyptian, Egyptian and German. I they're different. People will fight over them. I'm sure there's been wars fought on it. They're the same damn thing, okay. as far as I'm concerned. I don't sweat it. <laughs> Whatever you got, it's great. You know, the Germans just think theirs is the best. The Egyptians think well, theirs I is the best. It's fine. Versus... Yeah, the Egyptians, the other one. Um, and, you know, or Persian, if you want to be more correct, because it grows all over the area. Uh, they're same genus, different species, if I remember Does right. Eh. It, it grows better in a pot. Um, it does not like our summer. Um, it doesn't do well. 
Okay. Yeah, I've so done it. it. I've gotten flowers. It was really a waste of my effort. And it, yeah, that, that's basically, I get one flower from it as well. Um, I also, um, I'll spare you the stories, but for people who have uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia and travel and are challenged by that, um, like if you, a friend of ours, a herbalist who lectured all around, um, she would always travel with a pound of chamomile and a French press. And when she'd get to her hotel, getting ready to lecture at a conference, big old handful in the French press, pour the water on there, go have dinner, go do whatever lecture she's got. She came back and now hours later, this has been steeping, drink is out cold. And so, you know, it's really, if you have chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, traveling is rough, chemical sensitivities, all of those really challenge you. And so this is a good one. And so, sorry, our lecture is supposed to be about back to school. So for kids who are stressing out, who are now eating not mom's yummy food anymore and getting the pizza and fries from the school lunch lady, um, chamomile can be helpful for the bloating, cramping, digestive issues. It can also, for those first few days of school where they're not sleeping out of stress, jitters, even if it's positive, they're not sleeping well the night before, knock their ass out with some chamomile. Um, and if you add honey to it, it's fine because it, it is an intense flavor to do it right. So you couldn't drink that every night, though, could you? Why not? Can it, sure. It's more tonic. I thought it was a It's sweet not sweet. a tonic. And so, you know, you don't want to over sweat somebody. So you would change your dosage if you're doing it I mean, every you night. you have a sleep disorder. Like you're... I'd say it's okay. It, this isn't going to fix a sleep disorder. Right. But it's for I need to start learning how to go to sleep at nine, 10 o'clock at night, and I need to be unconscious, this will knock your ass out. So it's not fixing it, but it will knock a kid out for okay. a couple hours, yeah, for a couple of nights if necessary. Um, and to make it, a, don't steep it as long, don't use as much as a nice after dinner drink, just to settle down for your night. It, it's lovely that way. Um, in the tea bag, especially for goopy eyes, uh, red itchy eyes. This is a wonderful thing to use as like witch hazel pads. Witch hazel is another herb that's good for that. But this is great for those uh, irritated red itchy eyes. This can be helpful, especially if there's goopy things. Dogs and cats who always have gook coming out of their uh, tear ducts. This is a real winner. Echinacea. Echinacea is a phenomenal herb if you've been bitten by a snake or stung by a scorpion or have blood poisoning. For colds and flu, it would be so far down on my list of herbs to use. And the amount that you would need to take is ridiculous. Um, there, there's a lot of people who take this every day for preventing colds and flu. It's kind of a waste. It will stimulate your immune system, increase your white blood cell count for about two weeks. And then if you keep taking it, it will bring it, it will drop back down to normal. It, will, that, that chart is wrong. They read it. it doesn't go low. It, it doesn't go, it doesn't damage your immune system, but it does bring it back down to normal. A lot of people say it ruins your immune system. It doesn't. Yeah. Chart wrong or something. Yeah. Well, they There's said it. And yes. And so it. some, it, it does stimulate the immune system. Yes. A lot of people are saying it damages your immune system or lower your immune system. It does not do that. That was the mistake. Oh, okay. So it just drops it back down to normal. It no longer affects it. The problem is it will affect you with an autoimmune disorder. If you have an autoimmune disorder and you take echinacea, it will make it worse. So that. And it's fine for inflamed tissues. If you get it, like if you have swollen tonsils and you drip it on there, it'll have some benefit. Um, there's so many better herbs that don't taste nearly as crappy. <laughs> like so for strep, right? so It'd be okay for strep slow. Exactly cool, the yeah, there's better and herbs. Andagraphis works better. Um, there's lots of other herbs that, that will have a, uh, and for strep throat, I, I would, maybe add it to the formula if I had it, it'd be like, eh, 
like a fiery softball. Yeah, there's so many better things. Okay. <laughs> it would work topically for blood poisoning, for snake bite, which you don't get a lot in high school or middle school, you know. <laughs> It is phenomenal, and, and, and I have used it specifically for blood poisoning that I should have been in the hospital for and gotten IV. Orally? Yeah, and for snake bite orally and topically. Um, and there are many, many modern cases in the last ten years of, of great examples. Sam Kaufman, who teaches uh, first aid a lot, uh, it, it has many stories about that. Uh, so. Did you use a tincture, like to put it on, or what were you? Putting? They used a tincture, I think. Yeah, and so when I had blood poison, I just did it internally as a okay. tincture. Yeah, um, and I was doing not droppers. I was doing teaspoons every hour. And when you look at the dosing of echinacea, even for something like strep throat, you should be doing about that dosage to have any effect on, on the body. Doing a tincture or capsule two or three times a day isn't gonna do a damn thing, <laughs> except you know diminish your pocketbook. Um, so great herb. I, I just always like to talk about it because like there's so many good herbs, don't use that. <laughs> I say that when I got blood poisoning, I didn't have any echinacea. How did you get blood yeah, that was my answer. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so, so if if you've never if you've never joined us for Herb Day, Herb Day is a very fun day. It's the first Saturday of May, and uh, we have music and vendors and lectures and all of this. And I used to make all the stuff for Herb Day, and so I make a bunch of really weird Chinese. I make jellyfish uh, salad, and I do a. a black chicken uh, soup and I was making kava for everybody. And so I'd make like six, eight gallons of kava and I have my own way I make it. And I use coconut milk because it tastes good. And I always get some fresh coconut. So I'm breaking open the coconuts and I'm prying it out with a, a, a butter knife. And at this point I had been sampling the kava. It was 11 o'clock and I was tired. I'm not sure I'd really eaten anything other than a few pieces of coconut. And I slipped and I stuck the butter knife through my hand to the point where it was like this. Um, and I, you know, you're not supposed to pull out a puncture object. I pulled it out and um, there was a little bit of blood, you know, like it had a pulse, which means I, I didn't hit an artery, but an arterial, a smaller version of that, um, you know, and when you get any kind of severe bleeding, you, you know, apply direct pressure, elevate your hand. It didn't work. Um, the blood would got in more pads, more pressure, more elevation. I didn't have enough hands. I was there by myself. So I couldn't even, you know, compress an artery there. Um, so I, I, you know, the initial moment of panic that we all have when we hurt ourselves, like, oh crap, oh crap, I didn't have health insurance. So extra, oh crap. And I was like, oh wait, I'm an herbalist. Um, so there's a Chinese, <laughs> there's a Chinese formula that is a classic for stop bleeding called Yunnan Baiao. Um, yeah, you don't know how to spell that. <laughs> um, that, that is a stop bleed and can be used topically or internally. So I was like, wait, I have some of that. And I took off all of my compression things. I put on a little you know, buy out and, and it stopped almost immediately within seconds. Um, I was like, okay, I stopped the bleeding. I need to just stop. I got to get up at four o'clock in the morning and go run this huge event. And I wake up in the morning and my hand is like four times its size. Can't move my finger, weird tingly things. And this little red line is starting to run up my, and I'm like, that is the classic, oh, you're screwed. You got blood poison, go to the hospital. I went, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, what do I do? And I just went into the office to get ready for the event. <clears throat> and I was like, I think echinacea is the right, thing and I had no echinacea in the clinic. So as soon as somebody from the staff got there, I was like, go down to Rolling Oats and buy every ounce of all of the echinacea, every tincture, every bottle. And they came back and I started doing shots, you know? And so partly drunk at that point. Uh, by one in the afternoon, full function of my hand, no red line, no swollen lymph node, no, nothing wrong with it. Um, started uh, massaging St. John's wort oil like the next day, 
no nerve function, no damage to the hand whatsoever. So now, would you consider that maybe staph? Like, like, you know, like I've had like little- No, that was blood poison. There was an, I mean, it is technically okay, a, some sort yeah, of a staph, whether it was had, that bacterial or, or not, you yeah, could only tell I by testing. Well, I didn't go to the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Staff, but, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it works, but you got to use it for the right thing, right? Or for right. <laughs> Impressive, <laughs> stupid, I don't know. Yeah, I, was, I wanted me some coconut out of there. <laughs> Uh, marshmallow <laughs> so all, I, there's a couple of mallows we'll talk about so everything in the mallow family has this a similar unique property and so most of you know a mallow even though you don't know it um okra is a mallow and so the slime maliciousness that is okra um you either love it or hate it uh and so all the mallows have similar amounts of moistening uh sliminess that for somebody who tends towards dry can be of great benefit so marshmallow um is specific for the lungs and so for dry cough uh it's phenomenal so covid post covid i've used a lot of marshmallow so for dry sticky cough where you can't expectorate out the the crud this is your go-to um it can also be used for kind of chronic constipation it can be used for acid reflux dry chronic dry skin this is your friend it tastes good value added it almost tastes like nothing um you can use all parts of this plant. So everything from the root to the leaves to the flower, if you're lucky enough to have flowers. Um, so, oh, no, go for it. What they got? Melanie, you can go ahead and, and shout it yourself. out. Feel free to just shout out your question. Hi, Bob, again. Um, you, you just said that marshmallow um, tastes good. But the other day, I actually got a batch from Frontier, and I okay. made a cold infusion, mm -hmm. and it was horrible. Ooh. It was, yeah. So, and I know, I was like, wait a minute. I, I thought I read that it's supposed to be sweet, that it's supposed yeah. to be, but it wasn't. And it actually, it almost tasted a bit toxic. Oh. Yeah. So what do you think was wrong with it? Do you think it's the actual batch that I got from Frontier? It's Was it root or leaf? It's root. The root isn't as, it, the root shouldn't taste like that, but the root is not as yummy as the leaf. Um, I tend to, for most mild cases, I use the leaf because it's just gentler and easier to work with. The root is more for chronic, deep, internal things where there's a, like chronic dry intestines, ulcerative colitis kind of stuff is really the only time I use the root. And it's funny, it probably has to do with when it was harvested. The fall harvest of the, um, of the root tends to be crappier tasting. And whether that's better or worse, I don't know. I like the early spring or summer, the fresh active growth seems to be the sweetest. And there's a lot of debate, like there's a lot, we tend to get our greens, our aerial parts in the spring and summer because those are actively growing. And then the energy goes back down into the roots. And so the fall harvest is thought to be superior for a lot of roots, unless you want them to taste good, in which case then it's stupid. <laughs> hey, this is Shirley. So, um, oh, yeah. oh, wait, oh, I'm Yeah, sorry. go ahead, Melody. Just one more thing. So with the leaf, are you going to also do a cold infusion or are you gonna do a hot infusion with that? Cold infusion is oftentimes preferred. I don't actually, I find it's about the same. So you could, okay, so I- yeah. I don't okay. overthink it. I'm all, I'm a fan of simple and like, and you know, especially like you're obviously already exploring all of this good stuff, try both and okay. see what it looks like. Like one of my favorite things for myself, screw the students. Um, when I'm exploring a new herb or a plant, I'm, I wanna understand it better. 
outdoa, vinegar extraction, alcohol extraction, decoction, hot, cold infusion, long and short, and shop and compare. And literally sit there and feel like you're going through a wine tasting and see what nuance and flavor and textures and give it a couple of minutes. Like some herbs, you put them in your mouth and you run it around your mouth like a good wine tasting, right? And um, and then swallow it best on an empty stomach because then you're like, where do I feel it in my body? What what thoughts, what temperatures? And that may happen over time. And you can really discover some fascinating things, especially when you start to use different kinds of extractions like that. Super fun. Well, the reason why I was using it was for dry bronchial um, asthmatic. So that's and that was I what I was about to say is for yeah. those kids who get exercise induced asthma and dry air, the right. leaf is phenomenal. And the leaf. Easier. Okay, so yeah. you I was using the root. The root. Yeah. I was using the root because of the, the mulsancy, right? Yes, because I wanted it to be slimy and gross yeah. and whatever and go down and just be wonderful and magical. But it Did wasn't it taste like, like shit. That. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't like that. Yeah. The, Thank the, you. Le the leaf will take a little longer to get there. But for a chronic, I prefer the, the leaf is so much more subtle and gentle, but it'll get you there. The root's correct, but yeah, the root's just a little bit more work. That's all. And Shirley, you had a question. I think that was Yes, you kind of answered my question in response to her question. I was going to ask if you can use it long term for a chronic dry cough. hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's considered food. Okay. Uh, so super, you know, some herbs, it's like short term's great or like be careful with it. I just enjoy the hell out of some marshmallow. You ain't gonna okay. nothing with it. Okay, <laughs> and I, I will say I it is not native to Florida. It is native to the uh, Southeast. I think it actually goes all over the place. I have grown it successfully here. I've kept it going for uh, over two or three years now, but you have to pay attention. Okay. Um, it, it likes wet feet. It likes rich soil. So uh, you definitely have to pay attention, especially in the winter time, it'll dry out. Um, and it definitely think, you know, marshmallow it is a mallow that grows in the marsh and so we think of marshes tend to be shady so uh, in the it's ground a or in a container I, i've always grown it in a container because our soil stinks here okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah i put it in a pot it does have you, know, you can see that picture there has the long roots so i usually get like a good five gallon pot that it can grow in and it does all right and you know i can pull my leaves off i usually get a few flowers if i really pay attention um and so you you won't get a lot out of it but i think Growing a plant, you get to know it better. Yay. This one, y'all know this plant. And if you're if you're in Florida, you know this plant. <laughs> so this is the most amazing, awesome, multi-useful, way cool thing. And we have the wrong plant family on there. I am embarrassed. I apologize. This is not a Laminaceae. This is an Asteraceae. My bad. I thought we corrected that. Oh, so it's not a mint. No, it's not in the mint family. Even though it has a square stem, it is not a mint. It is an aster. Um, so by uh, so it's really funny. We did we've done a couple of videos about Biden's. Um, so we did one, and um, on the 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 front screen of this YouTube video, it said Biden's. Uh, actually, it said Biden's Alba, and I posted it on this one plant thing, and I got booted off of Facebook for like four or five days because I thought I was posting a political statement. And I was like, you idiots, it's a plant, it's Latin. <laughs> so this is Latin, bi is two, dense is dental, teeth. So it's two teeth, alba, white flower. Most um, Biden's plants have a yellow flower. So you can see, those are the seeds there. They have the two little teeth that stick to you. So bite dense al uh, alba. It's a description of the plant. <laughs> There's no political statements at all. <laughs> so this is, um, I, I love talking about this plant because it's so versatile. Um, but looking at it from that, that back to school kind of idea, the leaves of this plant are specific for a lingering cough after a cold and flu where you have clear or white phlegm. And I think all of us at some point have had a cold or flu. 
um, where sometimes that little nagging, <coughs> I'm fine, don't worry, I'm not contagious. It can last for weeks or months. A teaspoon to a tablespoon of the leaves chewed up fresh will resolve that 80% of the time within 15 minutes. She literally chew or? Chew and swallow, yeah. You need the yucky taste, it's very bitter. Um, I've used it on children as young as two years old. Um, we are made a tea out of it, they weren't gonna get to chew it up. I've not used it on younger because I haven't had the opportunity. I would happily. Uh, Okay, they that's know, awesome. They know that thing. That's awesome. Yeah. It's growing in Florida. Yeah, it's a weed. Here, I pulled this out of the back. Ever like get home and there's like stuff stuck to your shoes and your pant leg, like little things you have to pull out. Okay. That's that. Super annoying, but nice. Yeah, that's some Yeah, the flowers are yummy. Um, it can also be used topically for bug bites and abrasions. Um, and just so just mashing it up and putting it on the flowers and the leaves, all parts are edible, um, but the leaves uh, are the medicine. It can be used for chronic, or it can be used for acute or chronic lung conditions. And so it's a good addition to any kind of a cough, anything from smoker's cough to COVID cough. Um, but it's so specific for that lingering cough. This is magic for that. I see it for kidney problems. What? Eh, I haven't used it for that. <laughs> <laughs> it, like, no, there's people who use it for that. Uh, this is also a Chinese herb. Uh, okay. Xiao Feng Sao. Uh, Xin, Xin Feng Sao, excuse me. So Martina or anybody else who's Chinese uh, medicine-y folks. Xin Feng Sao is the Chinese name for that. Um, so. It's been used for chronic malaria. It's, um, I've used it for leukemia, not as a standalone, but in addition, especially because it's free. Um, I've actually, I've used it for, um, I have used it for kidney issues. I lied. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I had somebody, it was actually at the Florida Herb Conference. I want to say it was the first or second year I was working first aid for them. And um, I was getting ready to go on my lecture. And, you know, you kind of like, it's a big deal to talk in front of other herbalists and all and spout off about I know stuff. And <laughs> so, you know, you kind of got to get you, you, you need that half an hour, an hour beforehand to get your head in the game. And right as I was getting ready to walk out to where I was lecturing, they, uh, Bob, 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 somebody needs your help. Like grab your stuff. And I'm like, what's wrong? And they're like, I don't know, but she can't get out of bed. So I had mostly Chinese herbs with me. And so I grab up this duffel bag of stuff. I throw it over my shoulder and I run over there. Um, it was one of the volunteers and she uh, was in acute, acute kidney failure that she was on dialysis three days a week. And she had been five days at the herb conference <laughs> and had not gotten dialysis. And, you know, that's like, you're going to die. And she refused to go like people were volunteering to take her we can call an ambulance i'm not going to do it and their chinese herbs are amazing classical formulas pills powders potions all this good stuff almost all of them have licorice in there which when you're in kidney failure is completely contraindicated i couldn't give her a single thing so i gave her biden's um because she was filling up with hot toxic stuff and she was getting edemic she was swelling up with fluids um and i did that and i burned mugwort over some acupuncture points and it actually got her through the extra 24 hours we needed to get her to the hospital um so bad choices on her part but yes i have used this for kidney and issues um anything from eating it will help to you know the stuffed up ears okay. black blocked eustachian tubes it will actually help to resolve that phlegm just the same way it helps it in the lungs it works best fresh you can use it dried i would just increase your dosing um oh and i forgot about chronic lyme disease uh this is a classic yeah there's two herbs we'll talk about that are uh specifically utilized for chronic lyme disease can yep. you use it as a tincture um you can use it as a tincture if you're going to tincture it i would tincture it fresh if you have the opportunity and how um, would you use it for an acute lung condition um 
I, I like, you know, if you're in Florida, it's awesome. Again, right, we have plenty. <laughs> yeah. So use it fresh, harvest higher than the dog's leg. Um, and, and just, you know, I would say the dosage is yes, but again, teaspoon to a tablespoon, uh, you could, you know, I consider it food, throw it in a salad or a soup or stir fry is fine as well. Uh, so I would say you could use up to 20 grams easily and not think twice about it. It's cooling. Um, sorry, I'm going to go with Western and has a, a, a slight fluid. It helps to transform fluids there. I think I can say that and has a lymphatic function. There we go. It's easier in Chinese, but yeah, that, <laughs> I'll play it safe like that. Someone online asks how you can use it for arthritis. Um, if you have hot swollen joints for arthritis, it will be helpful. So if heat makes your arthritis worse, it will be helpful. And yeah, smoker's cough as well. It's, it doesn't cure smoker's cough because if you're still smoking, you're screwed. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, smoker's cough sucks, ex-smoker. Um, and, and so having that uh, can really help to resolve it. Seriously, is it really almost eight o'clock? Oh, we go to late 30, don't we? Oh, good, man. Sorry. So can I, can I just go to get a garden store and get this? No, they don't sell that. It's weed. It's literally everywhere. It's, it's like every backyard. Yeah, we, it's my backyard. yeah you totally have it in your backyard. Once you find it, it's like oh, Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, we have it dried at the clinic, but like, it's seriously, it's in your backyard. Yeah, it's totally in your backyard. <laughs> Please enjoy it. <laughs> you can weed some more while you're here. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The flowers are the tell. Yeah. And it's a distinct leaf and stem. So it's pretty easy to find. There is one look alike vaguely, but that's medicinal. It has a different function, but it won't kill you. Yeah. You won't die. Um, so. So Biden's eat it only. Huh? Um, Melanie asked, "You can only eat Biden's." No, you can no. make tea out of it. You know, I for medicine, I like it, for that it, that chronic cough. I think actually chewing it up fresh has the best effect. Um, making an infusion of tea out of it uh, will work, but I think it works better in all its bitter glory. <laughs> I've used it topically for bug bites. I make a tincture with witch hazel that I use. Oh, that's a great also, idea. Like, my son's bug bites get so infected, he just chews it up and puts it on, and it's gone. Yeah, it, it is frightening how effective. For those folks who have a, yeah. a hyperhistamine response to like mosquito bites, yeah, it's amazing. it is shocking how effective and how fast within a minute or two completely resolve that bug yeah. bite wow. and takes the, the sting of the bite. Yeah. So think hot, swollen things uh, in the anywhere but in the skin or in the lungs. It is, it's a winner. Yeah, for bee sting, it would be great. Huh? Yeah. yeah. I use witch hazel with it, and I actually do it. Grind it up, or um, you throw it in. Hmm. Take a medicine making class. Yeah. The square stem, isn't that normally mint? It, it is, is oftentimes mint, but in this case, it's not. Okay. I just, just remember. <laughs> That's why, like, we quickly didn't look it up. And yeah. so, like, 15 years ago, we wrote, oh, it must be a mint. And okay. we, we were wrong. We were corrected. <laughs> uh -uh. Melanie, you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Oh, yeah. One more question, Bob. Yeah. In regards to chewing it up and putting it on the skin, kind of like plantain. Yes. I've yes. always, I have a, a quick question in regards to that. What happens if somebody has like severe gingivitis? Okay. And they've already got infection in their mouth, right? Um, and they're chewing something like, let's say, plantain. They got stung by a bee, chew the plantain, put it on. Won't that infect? the area because of well, their infection in their mouth? Probably not. Um, if you had an open wound, but the bee sting, what you're seeing is uh, a histamine response um, among other things. So it's swollen tissue, but it's not, even though yes, a stinger went in, uh, same thing with the mosquito, 
that's sealed up pretty much. And so you're having uh, an effect through the skin that I no human bites are the most disgusting. Screw gingivitis. There are all kinds of creepy bacteria. Human bites are worse than a dog bite. Right. Um, and yet topical, literally spit poultices work like a champ. And you don't, and, and if it's like, no, that really creeps me out. I'm not doing it. You don't have to, like, you can do a spit poultice like this. Like, that'll work just as well as, it's a little wetter now, so, you know, here, I'll throw it at you. No. <laughs> so both are considered a spit poultice. Even if you go like that, it's still called a spit poultice, even though you didn't spit on it. Um, you could wet it with some water. Um, I'll oftentimes use, uh, aloe or purslane, um, just depending on what I have available or cactus to add a little bit of spit to it because not everybody's okay with some stranger spitting on them. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, depending on who you're working with, you can use other things. The spit is more about a wetting agent and there are enzymes in there that help to deactivate things. Um, so your spit has digestive enzymes specifically for um, carbohydrates and sugars, if I remember right. Um, sage, keep it going. <laughs> you can grow sage here, but it's a pain in the ass. We, we actually have something that's doing pretty good. Um, so this is stuff your per turkey sage. This is not uh, ceremonial desert sage. So this, this is literally the sage you buy in the grocery store. And that's really important to remember because it's like, if you live in a condo and you're not growing any plants and yet you want access, literally you can go to the grocery store and get medicinal herbs. Sage has many, many uses. It is so specific for a sore throat, especially if there's a loss of voice. And I will say this is one of my go-tos for the loss of taste and smell with COVID. So say that again. So it's specific for throat throat stuff, right. you know. Uh, to the loss of smell and taste, it seems to have, this is one of the things that this along along with other mints, um, usually something a little bit more aromatic, seems to be really effective in bringing back the smell and taste pretty quickly. And just drinking it as tea, you can do a gargle I think with I it. I lost my smell after I got it. But Extra turkey stuffing for you. <laughs> I think months, like it wasn't. Yeah, there, there's a Facebook uh, group, a closed group that I'm on for, that's for herbalists who only if they've treated COVID um, to share information. And this reoccurs a lot in that group of the sage. Yeah, it's just like, it's such a simple thing. It's inexpensive, it's easy to source. Um, make a tea out of it, yeah, it. just a tea. Yeah, you know, I actually like the taste of sage. It's kind of like if you've never chewed a leaf of sage, it's really intense. So, yeah. tea is preferable. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're into growing, sorry, too much information. Uh, yay, ground, pretty sage plant. Woo. The problem is, especially in the summertime, the heavy rain comes, it hits the dirt. And that sand and dirt will splash up, get stuck on the leaves, and it will cause a fungus. And so that's why we lose our lavenders. That's why we, a lot of our delicate plants, especially the aromatics, it just, they belong in England. They belong, you know, someplace else. If you get some like clams or oysters or some sort of shell and turn them upside down, I actually, I put a layer of sand around the base, like clean white sand, like, like sandbox sand and then take some shells, turn them upside down like this. Um, and that will usually be enough. And don't let it touch the stem, but get it close to the stem. That way, when the raindrops come down, they hit this and run off and don't splash up. Huh. Sneaky tricks I've learned over the years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually eggplants can get some fungusy this time of year. Yeah. So this is, I should have pulled this. I knew this slide was in here. Cedar is another uh, mallow and another Florida native. Uh, you might know it as wire weed. It's the thing that like you mow it down and you're, if you're out there weed whacking, your weed whacker will wrap around it. And you're like, ah, ah, cuss it out. <laughs> um, this, this is an Ayurvedic herb called um, Bala, B-A-L-A. It's got a really unique property to it called, it's called Tridoshic. So it's, you know, pit of Atacafa. 
Um, it's good for all three doshas. And it's the uniqueness of the, uh, the mallow, the moistening, nourishing aspect of it. Plus the root is a felony. Yes, I did say felony. Uh, don't take this plant across state lines or you're going to jail. Um, it contains ephedrine. And so for any of you who are entrepreneurial uh, and want to make some herbal meth, this is your source. Uh, <laughs> new careers. <laughs> uh, so I, what, what was the show? I can't, I, like, I don't know how to make that, but that's why they banned ephedrine. That's the real reason. It wasn't because it was killing people. Um, so um, the roots contain ephedrine, which is a bronchial dilator. It's fancy talk for opens up your lungs. Um, this can be, the root can be used similar to an inhaler. Um, Renee's got, one of her kids has exercise induced asthma. He still has uh, a, probably a pint left of a really strong uh, tincture of CETA. And if he starts wheezing, he'll just throw a couple uh, droppers down and it immediately opens up his lungs. Um, so the problem with a lot of your ephedrine containing plants and as well as like emergency inhalers, so drying, it literally dries out those tissues. It also causes heart racing and things like that. So the moistening aspect of the mallow seems to counteract the side effects and gives it a mellower use. And I would say actually better than like the Chinese mahuang, the uh, Fedra chinensis. Um, so the leaves and flowers, more moistening specific to the lungs, but not stimulating, not a strong bronchial dilator, more moistening to the lungs. The root has opening up the lungs um, plus the moistening aspect. So all parts of this can be used. Um, I'll let y'all do your research on the seeds because there's a whole, I haven't worked with the seeds as much, but they're really interesting. Um, the flowers are quite distinct and we have a, at least three, if not more different species of Ceda. Um, they all have similar flowers. They're open half the day. So they'll open and then they'll close up into a, I don't know what that shape is. Um, but the leaves of all of, or the flowers of all the mallows have this pinwheel overlapping little flower petals uh, that's very distinct. So you see that in hibiscus, you see that in mallow, uh, marshmallow, you see that in cedar. All of it. If you grow okra, you'll see it in the okra. Um, so a yummy trailside nibble, but also again, moistening the lungs and it's native. So it's really convenient. So that dry cough, the exercise induced asthma, this is a winner um, and it's free because it's in your yard. Time, it's late. Oh my God, I gotta talk faster. I wanna get to a couple of good ones here. They're all good. Yeah, right. Um, time is, uh, a good one to add into, remember we talked about the yarrow elder and chamomile as my go-to. I will oftentimes throw thyme in there as well. It's um, really helps to open up because it's um, very aromatic. Uh, I grew up in the Bahamas where we use thyme for everything. <laughs> it kills stuff. Um, for folks who have toenail fungus or athlete's foot, uh, again, a back to school issue for the athletes. Um, a toenail fungus is one of the hardest things to address. It's such a pain. Um, you need to make dietary changes, topicals, internals, creepy stuff. Um, the active ingredient in um, Vicks Vapor Rub, thymol. That is the primary ingredient that gives it, you know, it's got some camphor or whatever in there. Thymol is the essential oil of thyme and helpful for opening up the lungs but I'll have people put big fix vapor rub on their feet for athlete's foot. And one of the more effective things, it's the time all in there that's doing it. So soak your feet in some strong time tea. It's good. All right, that's enough on time. Ginger, ginger is magic. You can grow ginger down here. It's not native, but you can grow ginger. Um, all of the Zinzibera family herbs have similar function. This, and you know, 
somebody was asking about how do you use Biden's for arthritis? And I said, if it's hot and swollen, it'll work. If it's cold arthritis that improves with heat, then ginger is good for arthritis. It's also good for nausea, vomiting. Um, it is warming for folks who have a cold belly, who have too much cold drinks. For those of you with little kids who got their first taste of iced tea or a Slurpee and they guzzled it down and then puked, it's because they put too much cold in their belly. And so little kids have really weak digestion and cold things put out their digestion. I, I saw somebody made an Ayurvedic comment, the agony, the, the digestive fire. So if we put out our digestive fire, we either end up with diarrhea, stomach pain, or vomiting. And it's usually vomiting of clear fluids. So ginger will help to rekindle that digestive fire for those folks who have very weak digestion, pale tongues, always chilled. This is magic. Yeah, nausea and the fresh is best for nausea. And so you can make like fresh ginger tea. Dried is better for, I'm always freezing cold. My body literally feels cold to the touch. Then dried ginger works better. That's all I want to say. I've used that for I've also boiled it for pots. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it's like you can, I like it better with a long hot infusion, but it's not wrong to boil it. You lose some stuff, but it still kicks ass. Okay. And oh, oh, sorry. Bring up uh, putting it in honey. Sense. Yeah. So like uh, you don't want to boil it in honey, but to heat it in honey can be really powerful. And so adding other things into honey. You can juice it. That, that's that in a lot of for any, know, raw juicing type. Yeah, I never things. recommend uh, juicing or smoothies to people because they end up with too much fruit in there oftentimes, but it's energetically very cold. So they're like, screw you, I'm juicing anyway. I was like, okay, fine, put some ginger in. Uh, so that actually changes the temperature and doesn't damage the energetic okay. digestion that way. Um, question, how yep. do you see it compare with New England Aster for various asthmas? Um, I, and, and I have not worked with the New England Aster as much as I would have liked. Um, I think of the New England Aster as kind of dry, where the Ceda is very moistening. Um, and without a doubt, the ephedrine content in the root makes it dramatic, like instant. Um, and I didn't say the Ceda is also indicated for uh, chronic Lyme disease. Forgot that part. <laughs> um, Nettles is magic. It's particularly magic here in Florida. So we live in a hot, humid state, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> and stinging nettles is very drying. Um, and so if you live in a desert, if you live in a dry, mountainous area and you drink a lot of nettles, you will turn into a prune. You'll just like, and it'll dry you up. Here, because we're literally, even when it's dry here, it's oh, still yeah. freaking humid. I heard something. Your phone's going up. Yeah, going up. Well, go back down. You're not allowed <laughs> to climb the mountain without me. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is our go-to to any kind of allergies. Um, this is high in minerals. And so anybody who tends to be a little anemic uh, with low stomach acid needs to get some mineralization. Um, I just think of it as this wonderful nourishing tonic. You can do an overnight infusion and it tastes a little intense, but it's so good. I think it tastes like a fresh, fresh mown lawn. Um, but for any kind of, you know, kids who are dealing with, it's funny, up north in particular, New England, it's ragweed season. You have this like two months of suffering. I'm here to tell you that, by the way, the Latin name for ragweed, anybody? Ambrosia. Oh, <laughs> That's its Latin name. Go figure. Oh, Somebody man. was making a cruel, cruel joke, right? Yeah. Um, so it blooms year round here. In some yeah. parts of the year, yeah, no, we have, Ragweed is everywhere, as well as many other things that can cause uh, allergic rhinitis, same kind of thing. Yeah. So stinging nettles is literally my go to. That, yeah, which is the same as nettles. Yeah, it's just we, if you say stinging, people get scared. Um, so, they do sting like the nettles we have here. It's so fresh. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and so once you add heat to it, if you heat it, cook it, um, it will actually eliminate the stinging cells that are in it. So making an infusion will actually stop it from stinging so you. Yeah, a little sting never hurt Some nobody. Of the nice ones that we get, like even sting you through the gloves, but it's like yeah. you know you're not getting a rash, but you'll feel it, and then and like, you can away. grow nettles is native as you go a little bit further north or inland. You can grow it here. I've had a patch going for a couple of years now. You have to grow it just inside the drip line of an oak tree, or I've got mine is just inside the drip line of a moringa tree. Uh, so dappled light, richer soil. Um, I find it does well in like a little depression, not not muddy water, but where it might be a little bit more moist. Uh, and, and it's always funny. Nobody believes us when we say this. If you just walk up to a, net, a stinging nettles and bump into it, it will sting the crap out of you. It, it, it hurts for a minute. If you say, hey, I'm just saying hi, and you introduce yourself and you think positive thoughts, you can pet it. It won't sting you. Yeah, so make friends with your nettles plant and it will uh, treat you right. Adele says it will take over. Can you do that with I poison wish ivy? it would take over here. Uh, Can you do that with poison ivy? No, no I, I understand there's some unique properties of poison ivy. I have not worked with that plant enough. I try to pull that out of the ground. Um, calendula um, for any kind of acute or chronic skin stuff. This is a winner. Uh, so uh, as people are doing soccer practice, cheerleading, getting the bumps, bruises, sprains, and strains, this one is phenomenal. Um, also internally, this is great for uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. It's, we think of the skin and the intestines as the same. So in the same way, it will skin uh, soothe and heal the tissues on the outside. It will do the same on the intestines. And even though this is a delicate flower, it is, uh, the resins in here are the part we want. So actually decocting this or using a high proof alcohol is preferred if you're doing a tincture. So you gotta, you gotta work this one to get the good stuff out. Um, nothing wrong with doing a tea, you just don't get the maximum benefits from it. You can also just mash the plants up and make a poultice. So you're using for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease Fresh or, fresh or dried, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going fast because I want to get some good stuff. Yeah, but um, you can so ask. Would that, would that plant be good for wrestling? For wrestling? That's they always like, like their skin issues. So yeah, the, the mat burns. Yeah. So I would actually combine that with um, lemon balm <laughs> and a little andrographis because there's a thing called mat herpes. Yes. <laughs> it's a thing for, for pass it on to each other. Yeah. 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 And, and so like, and so if you're doing a topical for those abrasions, literally they can get herpes from that. And so adding stuff in that helps uh, both with herpes, antivirally stuff, as well as sprains and strains in, rug burn that you get from mats from getting your face squished across. <laughs> yeah, hundred yeah, percent. And you can throw in things like plantain would be correct. Um, you can actually buy uh, powdered lysine, L-lysine, the, amino, uh, the uh, amino acid that helps to stop herpes as well. So that, it's not wrong to think like, as long as we got a wrestler who's getting busted up, like throw in a, let's throw in a little prevention there with it. Okay, yeah. Um, I would say also, and if we don't have a slide for this, for the wrestling in particular, because they have to be little contortionists. And so um, using Solomon Seal for uh, helping to both strengthen and nourish the tendons to make them more flexible. And I would say from an Ayurvedic standpoint, um, goat's milk with ashwagandha was specifically used for that as well, so that they could tie themselves into little pretzels. Mm. I like this thumb and seal tastes way better than okay. <laughs> the ashwagandha is, uh, I believe translates something along the lines of horse urine. So <laughs> not my idea of my after dinner drink. Um, 
So hibiscus, another mallow. So cooling and moistening. The best thing about hibiscus, like you, for your uh, athletes who are doing two a days in the freaking heat of the summer, this is a great way to cool and nourish and mineralize them. It would do well with something like uh, nettles. Um, but this also makes all the crappy herbs taste good. Remember we said that like the first five minutes, how do we get our kids to drink this crap? Hibiscus. Hibiscus is yummy. Um, and so this is the classic uh, Jamaican hibiscus. This is sorrel tea. This is cranberry hibiscus, which I consider the interchangeable. Um, and it's sour, moistening, cooling goodness. This is not a Florida native, but grows like gangbusters. It will reseed itself and just generally kicks ass. Um, oh, it smells kind of funky, and when you taste it, it's sweet. Yeah, no, it's and so. I'm trying to be a tart. Yeah, sweet, it's it's, it's like, like a sweet tart. tart. Yeah, I was going to say it's strangely like. And you you like usually with a sour thing you get like, uh -huh. but you get like there's a wetness that comes from the back end of it. That's the mallow. Yeah, it's easy to grow. Let's just say that it's not native. You, don't like it. <laughs> yeah, you know what I find is it's kind of like, oh, can I have some more. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> it's literally, anybody who looks like I put this in almost all of my infusions just to get patient compliance. I want people to drink the crap I give them. I make some nasty teas. This covers up the flavor of everything. And so if you throw a little honey in with it, it's awesome. Um, one of my funny. favorite- How does it brighten your face? Brighten your, face? Um, your cheeks are getting red right now. <laughs> Seriously, because of the sour flavor. Like for real, I'm not even making that up. Um, so the combination of this rosemary with lemongrass is phenomenal tea, especially in the summertime to cool off. So again, looking at those folks who are like the football players uh doing two a days the cross country runners who are like just dying out there right now this this is like such a helpful thing and certainly better for you than gatorade yeah. uh, you know wow that's great so when you buy them it's sweet <laughs> it's always a sweet tart for me um Lemon balm, uh, this is lemon mint. Uh, this is, I, I don't find this sedating. This is for stress without being um, sedative. <laughs> so for kids who are stressing out, they need to uh, bring a water bottle into school. Um, this is super helpful. Uh, also, um, this is my go-to for long-term use for uh, oral or genital herpes. Also for shingles, because that's herpes. I made that mistake when I was very new intern in acupuncture school and somebody came in and I was like, oh, that's shingles. Except I call it, um, I, I called it by its proper name, uh, which is herpes. Um, which one is it? It's not, is it herpes? herpes zoster. zoster. Yeah, there we go. So I was like, oh, you got herpes zoster. And they're like, I don't have herpes. I was like, well, you kind of do, but I'll call it shingles just for you. <laughs> there's no, that I, I found out that I should just forget the fact that it's, there's 13 different herpes viruses. <laughs> Topically and internally both. I just mash it up, slap it on there. Um, you can make a tea out of it. It makes a lovely uh, hot infusion. Um, it tastes good. So for kids who are like stressed out about going, this is one that's not going to make them sleepy in school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't want to say, Renee put that one in. I don't have anything to say about that. I'm going to skip these because we're almost out of time. Um, so I know it's all about herbs. There's some benefits to supplements too. Um, B complex for any of the kids who are uh, vegetarian or vegan and adults need a B complex, uh, in particular B12, but all the B vitamins work well together. Uh, for your kids who have a hard time focusing um, for the ADD, B complex is magic. <clears throat> and I speak from experience as the ADD boy. Um, I don't have the HD, I wish I had that much energy. If I forget my B complex in the morning, I walk into a room going, why did I come in here? Crap. And I walk out of the room to try to remember. 
crap, why did I walk out of there? And, and I will go around for hours before I go, oh, dumbass, you forgot to take your bees this morning. And within an hour, focus. For nerve pain, I don't care why, be complex. Carpal tunnel syndrome is frequently a B6 deficiency. How much do you take? Uh, sorry, too much information. MTHFR, the motherfucker gene. Uh, <laughs> That's for, <laughs> for real. That's, that's, that's like, I just I, I eat a chewable. That's all I'm saying. So. so literally, this is there's two. Some people would argue three specific gene expressions that if you have all of them turned off, you're all screwed up, and you don't process or methylate B12 in right. particular right. well. Right. And so go, literally Google that, but you can see why we call it the motherfucker gene, because okay. uh, it's, it's a pain. You end up with a lot of chronic diseases and, and fatigue and autoimmune That's disorders. Like I, but I can't digest like a B-complex pill. Like I'm burping it up. No, you have a shitty B-complex. That's why. Then I tried <laughs> the spray one. Yeah. I have a methyl and that's probably just B12. They're rarely a B complex. You should get a B complex. Um, well, you got it at the store? I don't know. Yeah, we've got a food based one there that's very easy. Like, I, I most of the B complex, I will vomit if I take it on a B comp on an empty stomach. Yeah. The yeah, ones yeah. we have at the clinic, I carry because I pop that on an empty stomach in the morning. Not a problem. Yeah. Still take it with food. Uh, that one will not repeat. It doesn't stink like cold. Like, if you open up your B complex jar and you're like, oh, bang, what died in there? I wouldn't eat it. Um, even if it's methylated, uh, <laughs> there's <laughs> nothing good about gummies. <laughs> Do you have that up here or is it down? Down in the, the clinic, okay. yeah. Um, vitamin C, not to talk about COVID, but vitamin C, I learned as a kid, um, you know, I think, I think Linus Pauling was still alive then. I learned uh, as a little kid that uh, up to 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C every three to four hours if you're sick, you're good um, to bowel tolerance. If you get loose stools, cut back. You took too much C. Um, generally, it's around three to four hours for you to process it out. More than 2,000 milligrams, you're making expensive urine. Um, I think I made kidney stones. It's, it's really high powered C and the pack, you know, the it's, ones that are like, super. Yeah, the, some of those have too much calcium in them. And so it's possible. Um, Vitamin C is my go-to for colds and flu. It also has an anti-inflammatory aspect to it. So um, God, not enough time for stories. Um, <laughs> before there was orthoscopic surgery, I had a, a torn meniscus, medial meniscus. I went, yeah, it was 10 days in the hospital, Frankenstein scar, which now would be just a little puncture. Um, I woke up on like the third night, I probably rolled over and I was like, ah, and I was in pain and I rang for the nurse. And um, the next morning, my mom came back in. So, I, you know, how was the night? And, you know, blah, blah, blah. I was like, ha, ha, ha. The doctor wanted us to start reducing his Tylenol 3 or whatever they were giving me. So we gave him placebo. Placebo is frequently vitamin C. Oh. And so, A, I think my mom punched out the nurse. But, uh, <laughs> but the reality is, as a wound healing, anti-inflammatory, generally safe, vitamin C is decent. So, again... Kids starting up the sports, um, coming back with sore muscles, vitamin C can be helpful. You don't need that high dosing necessarily. A high dose I only use for um, uh, acute cold and flu. And, and how many milligrams a day safely? Daily, a thousand milligrams is probably more than enough uh, for most folks. And, and you know, I have a crappy immune system, so I, I take that twice a day. Linus Pauling, I'm a, I'm a Linus Pauling fan. Sorry, Google him. Uh, <laughs> the, the, he was an advocate for 10,000, but it was broken up into multiple dosages. It wasn't 10,000 in a single uh, pop. So recognizing that your body needs time to process that out. I think a thousand milligrams once or twice a day is more than enough for... Yeah, I do yeah. a lot of it. Okay, cool. Mike, are you 
know those ones in the past? The liposomal and stuff. Like, like, yeah. I was doing like 2000. I was doing it all for, I don't know. And I, I, and like, I, like, like, along with yeah. kombucha, which was a fuzzy. Yeah, kombucha is some shady stuff. I, I, mm -hmm. I like, so perfect. vitamin D is, <laughs> I, there are, there are, I like, I am not a big supplement pusher. I think everybody on the planet needs vitamin D and B complex. Yeah. And until you have blood work that tells you you don't need vitamin D, I guarantee you leave, you need vitamin D unless you're a lifeguard who has the best hand in town. If you have more melanin than me, i.e. you have darker skin, I guarantee you need vitamin D. Milk and cheese is not a valid source of vitamin D. <laughs> sunlight, yeah, sunlight is. Uh, but again, with melanin, you can't absorb it. And a number of people don't have the ability to convert D2 into D3. It's a kidney thing. And there's a genetic, uh, unique genetic trait that doesn't allow you to process D properly. General, yes, bone health, uh, but also your immune system and your emotional health. When we look at seasonal affective disorder, SAD, uh, vitamin D is thought to be the primary driver of that. Um, bone density, vitamin D is way more important than calcium. Uh, we, we get lots of calcium from a variety of sources, including vegetables. Uh, but for your immune system, I push, when we look at vitamin D, they, uh, when they do blood work for vitamin D, it's like 30 or 32, depends on who scale, all the way up to 100. So if you made it to 33, yay, you passed, you suck. Your immune system is trashed. Um, there is very good repeated research in the last year that shows that people who have a vitamin D level over 40 don't go to the hospital, aren't long haulers, don't die, and frequently don't get COVID when everybody else in the family does. I push all of my people at least above 50, especially in the world of COVID. <clears throat> I prefer them to be between 70 and 90. Then you rock. People with under 20 frequently end up with autoimmune disorders and cancer. Uh, so how much do you use? I actually tell everybody to take 5,000 I use daily until you get it tested. Um, and so some people, that's plenty. Other people need 10, 15,000 daily. Like, not usually. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, Multi-mineral, the only reason I would recommend that if you're on acid reflux meds, which case you're not absorbing minerals or B12, uh, if you have low stomach acid, sometimes kids do. Um, but if they're out there sweating their butts off in the sun and coaches slamming them with Gatorade, yay, that's more sugar than I would prefer a child to have. <laughs> so I, I look at some sort of a low dose multi-mineral can help, especially if they're getting cramps uh, at, at night or getting leg cramps or anything like that. Um, be careful with the multi-mineral, but for kids, sometimes they're out there sweating up a storm uh, in, in the sports realm. For the kids who can't sleep, who have a lot of anxiety, um, who have constipation, magnesium is one of my favorites to go to. It has many other uses that, I don't have enough time, sorry. Magnesium citrate will help move the poop better than magnesium glycinate. So if your kid has normal to loose stools, use glycinate, they can't sleep and anxiety. If they tend towards constipation, the citrate's cheaper and works great. Take it at night. It also is helpful for ADHD. Get the unflavored for ADHD because ADHD is frequently aggravated by um, flavors and colors, red things in particular, red and blue piss off ADHD kids. Fish and plant oils. If you're vegetarian, do plant oils. If you're not vegetarian, do fish oils. They're easier <laughs> and cheaper. Um, things like flax oil um, for the for, um, evening primrose, flax, that's all I can think of. Um, I like the Udo's 369 because it uses a blend of different plant oils. Um, and the big tell, so especially high dose uh, essential fatty acids, the omega-3s are helpful for anxiety. They're helpful for ADD and ADHD um, and in a range of inflammatory issues. They're also helpful for um, some of the spectrum that can be very, very helpful. So um, 
<laughs> quick, easy to tell to see if your kid, and actually for acne, which obviously middle and high school is an issue. Quick tell to see if you have uh, a need to get more essential fatty acids, check the back of your arm. If it's bumpy or you only have acne on the back of your arm or the top of your thighs, you have an essential fatty acid deficiency. We call it chicken skin. Uh, <laughs> but really helpful for, um, for reducing inflammation. And so for kids who are on the autistic spectrum, uh, ADD, ADHD, start with fish oils and magnesium. It can change their world, it really um, help make that life easier. Yeah. On and fish oils like the dosages yes like i've given up to 10 grams daily that's a lot of fish oil <laughs> that's a lot of salmon they gotta eat um, melatonin i only like it short term um to help kids get adjusted to their uh early hours you know if they're busting into school and stuff like that they do cbd cbd will work as well yeah just to knock their ass out um, melatonin, <laughs> but melatonin specifically to help adjust your sleep schedule. Like that's part of our uh, circadian rhythm to work our day night. So if the kid's been all summer long, not going to school, staying up late playing video games, now he's got to get up at four or 5 a.m. to make the six, seven o'clock bus. Like, no, nah, we need a quick readjustment. It also works for flying and traveling through time zones and stuff like that. <sighs> No, oh, how much time do I have? One minute. No. One minute. Okay. So I had to throw some Chinese crap in here. So Yu Ping Fen Song Jade Windscreen contains three herbs: astragalus, which we talked about. That was the first herb we talked about. Um, something called Sila root, Feng Feng, uh, and uh, Attractylodes, Bai Zhu. That combination is for people with a, a weakened immune system and for disease prevention. And so it's generally considered very safe. Um, the only thick caution I would put on it, if you tend towards um, really hot and dry and constipated, it might not be the right thing for you. If you tend towards normal, loose, maybe a little phlegmy, it's magic. Uh, it's used long term rather than short term. So a kid going back to school, um, it's it's not wrong. Yin Chao, Yin Chao Jadu Piano is the proper name, um, is for early stage uh, colds and flu, in particular wind heat. We talked about that wind. So they're like, am I getting a fever? I'm feeling a little hot and flush. Yin Chao. What about Gamma Ling is very similar. I for the first 48 hours, I like yin chow better. Um, but both are appropriate, especially for kids, you know, like at little kids, elementary school, they, they catch everything and it's all very mild and you don't want to give kids more antibiotics than it's necessary. So something really simple like gan ma ling or, or yin chow is super correct. Um, xanthan magnolia is a variation of a cool Chinese formula it's kind of a combo of a couple of different ones. Uh, so technically that's song, but everybody says Kong. So Kong Er Tzu, Wan, Xin, Yi, Hua, Wan. It basically combines those two formulas together. It's, Is it a pill? yeah, yeah, and it's for sinus crap. So chronic sinusitis, uh, allergic rhinitis. This is a nice snot pouring out of your face. The same as xanthan nasal? Yeah, xanthan nasal and xanthan magnolia, they're slight variations, but xanthan magnolia is a nice safe, ah, you ain't gonna hurt nobody. Gotcha. Um, for crappy digestion, oh, I shouldn't have had all that pizza and root beer. Um, for adults who indulge in things that are also bad for you, like other things we do with pizza, um, the curing pills, and depending on where you learned Chinese stuff, they might be called Kanlingwan or Po Chai pills. Po Chai is more in southern China, Kanling is more in northern China. So, we, curing pills is the, the better company, modern version. Uh, it's just like, oh, I think I just ate yucky stuff, greasy, alcohol, those kinds of things. Um, you can do it pre and post poor food choices. Um, patchouli pills, the Ho Shang Shen Chi Wan, 
is somebody actually gets food poisoning, a stomach bug that the little kids get, they're power puking and pooping. And so you may need an IV, you may need uh, medication for that, but we've all had that as an adult or as a child and everything's off for a week or more. The, the Ho-Shang Chen Chi Wan, the patchouli pills, um, will usually fix it in 24 hours. And so for that, after you're done power pooping and puking, and like now you're just nauseous, use that. Um, I've used that on kids, probably the youngest I ever used it on was four or five, just used a smaller dosage, um, but generally very safe, nothing creepy in it. Um, some versions will have some trace amounts of gluten. So anybody with celiac disease would have to be cautious and just check the, the brand that you use. Um, if you have a gluten sensitivity, you won't notice it. There's not enough in there to make a difference. <gasps> oh, I think that was the last slide. Hallelujah. I did that in two hours. Hell yeah. So, yeah. so um, please check out the website. I hope you come to Free Classes, Not Free Classes. The YouTube channel has a crap ton of stuff on it. Um, we've got medicine making classes. We've got the herb school. We've got student clinic. If you want to get a little bit more focused on the right stuff for you, play with herbs. They're safe generally. <laughs> <laughs> if not, watch my herb drug interaction class. It's on YouTube. Uh, and, uh, you know, go see an herbalist, go become an herbalist because it kicks ass. When do you, uh, when is your next herbalist program start? Um, the Western program, the 101 is the, the lead into that. I want to say that's in November, but we've got a couple of times, like every month for a couple of months. The Chinese program starts in November as well. Um, do we need the 101 for the... Not for the Chinese. I think everybody ought to take 101, even if you don't want to do cool herbal stuff. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, it's like 101 is a, a two-day intensive where it's everything your grandmother knew like 30 herbs you can't kill anybody with some basic medicine making things like that yeah. uh we get fancy we kind of we push the envelope in the standard uh, everybody has a 101 class every herb school every herbalist teaches it we push that a little bit and put some advanced ideas in there okay. kind of like tonight that was a lot of information for a free class for total strangers uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I threw some strange concepts. We kind of do that with 101. We, we, we hurt your brain. No, nobody ever leaves asking for more. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, the Chinese herbal program starts to say that. Yeah, yeah. And you, we don't encourage both at the same time. It's too much. No, I would only do it. Yeah. And, and the Western program broken up into segments, much more diverse. And obviously they're Western herbs that people are more familiar with. Um, the Chinese is, I want to be a clinician. I want to see clients. I want a diagnostic and you'll get diagnostics in Western, but you also get more medicine making plant spirit. There's a, it's more well-rounded. Yeah. The Chinese is like, oh no, this is like prep school for acupuncture school with, we don't teach acupuncture, but doing the Western first. a lot of people do that. That, that is probably kinder to your brain space. <laughs> because you also have to get a lot of these herbs packaged in a Chinese way, right? I mean, it's, that was why I kind of went Western. I was studying with some herbalists in New York City. And, yeah. you know, when I was going down to Chinatown and I would go into the, you know, they were like, let me see a town. Right? Yeah. You know, and that's, and, that's... Thing, and it was cool, but I couldn't like go and collect it. Like, I'm kind of like, let me walk through the woods. You would be surprised. Stuff. I'd say it third of the herbs in Chinese medicine are Western. Oh, really? Uh, and just everybody forgets to look and at the Latin names. Into those shops, you know, yeah. down in the basement. And, and we have like, all, like we have yeah. over 900 herbs at the clinic. Okay. So and we have nice. all the Chinese and the Western and herbs. Like that. Yeah. You know, that was the names on the bottom. Yeah. And so <laughs> it, it, I mean, I've been going to acupuncture for 20, 30 years. So, mm -hmm. so that's, you know, I've taken herbs for 20 years. Yeah. So yeah, we learn it in Chinese. We use the same textbooks that the acupuncturists use. Um, it's more in depth and more intense, um, but very focused on clinician. Um, where the Western, a little bit more diversity. You still do tongue and pulse in Western. We'll, we'll use an energetic diagnostic system, but not until you really get into- How long is the Western? It's, a, it's basically two years. Yeah, both of them are two years. Going, coming. 
It's one week. It's one weekend a month for two years. Uh, and then, so the one weekend intensive, yay, 101 is just fun. Foundations, I think is eight months, eight weekends, um, one weekend a month. And then advanced is uh, a year long, again, one weekend a month. Uh, but then we do clinicals one night a week. And so you can so, do clinical with also. Yes. Yeah. No, we're still like, no, we'll still beat clinical okay. stuff. It's the the western system has to be recreated because we killed all the witches uh, <laughs> i mean i hate to say that but we burned we we burned the books we destroyed the knowledge and so we're having to pull it from the greeks and the anani tibs and the persians and the chinese and the ayurvedic so we've we've created this kind of cuckoo platter of and and not me personally, but like that's kind of Western system. You know, David, you know, brings the Cherokee that right. that. But it's it, it, David teaches a, a Chinese Cherokee Anani Tibbs system that is his own creation. And we all kind of create this in our own image. So I've influenced the Western. So there's a little extra Chinese in there. Um, Renee and I have both studied in South America, so we bring a little of the South American. Uh, I grew up in the Bahamas, so I bring a lot of Caribbean medicine into you were, it. Um, talking all about, um, oh my God. And all of you online, feel free to run away because I'm just babbling now. Thank you all so much for showing up, but feel free to listen in on us babbling here in the classroom. <laughs> oh, I missed them all. Um, nice ones <laughs> um, thank you all for the kind, uh, kind <laughs> words. Um, we don't do ayahuasca, um, nor do we teach it. Renee has been trained in it um, down in South America, but we won't run ceremony here. Um, That's a bummer. Yeah, I'll like, to to no, don't do that. <laughs> Please don't. Uh, I, have, I haven't. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't. Do that in Orlando. Yeah, they do. They do. Have they a place do. In Orlando, yeah. I'm, I'm just joking. I, there's yeah. a couple of places in Costa Rica. Yeah. Uh, I don't um, have any desire because grow up. I mean, I guess so like, so you need the worst reason. I mean, I, am, I will hold it in Be, to the last moment. And the, I there are many ways to tell whether or not a place is any good with ayahuasca, but if they're not talking to you about your. Uh, prescription medications, your healthcare status, and talking to you about dieta, your diet, uh, a month leading up to it. And if they're not util utilizing traditional songs into it, run. I don't, um, the rhythmia was really good. And now we got some concerns about what's going on there. Uh, Costa Rica. Highly recommended ones. Yeah, and, and I don't know what I, I. There used to be a group here that would bring people up from um, South America. I'm sure there still are, but that group doesn't do it anymore. It's just there starts. Even though yes, there's people who form churches and do it in Orlando and things like that. And I just don't feel like they do a, a good enough job. I wasn't impressed with what I saw. Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard a, a few issues. Like yeah, so. I don't, Renee probably can answer those questions better. What about mushrooms? Um, yeah, they're entertaining. Uh, <laughs> um, the folks who did Sacred Science, I continue to hear good. Sacred Science? Yeah, it's a movie. Um, you can find it on probably Netflix or uh, on YouTube or something. Yeah. But those folks, and I forget the name of their organization. I just got an email from them. I've heard good things about them. It's called Sacred Science? Yeah, and they did a documentary. It's an hour-long documentary okay. about, and specifically about, not uniquely ayahuasca, but that was a part of what they did. Okay. Um, all right. Smells Thank like you so much. What is ceremony? Oh, now there's oh. a question. Um, it's more the spiritual use of plants, and, and it can, it doesn't have to involve plants. So ceremony... Um, to me, is making a cup of coffee in the morning. If you grind the sea, the grind the beans and, and all that, so we have things like tea ceremony, smudging is ceremonial, uh, churches, some of it, yes, okay. yeah, a lot. They do a lot more plant spirit medicine. Um, for Western and Chinese, we actually have a twenty four hour camping trip um, where we pack a lot into that, but we do plant solo and things like that as part of the camping trip, some physical herb walks. There's more uh, learning the local plants in Western, but we learn them in Chinese as well. Okay, that sounds perfect. Yeah. Uh, that is spotted horseman. That's a Florida native, Mandera, I forget. 
Um, and that's holy basil. Like holy basil yeah. or basil. Yeah. I said, this smells like basil or cardamom. I knew that. Yeah, no. Okay. Cardamom. And that's growing out here? Yeah, yeah. We grow about 100 yeah, plants out there. The yeah. <laughs> so my husband just got put on that. Well, that sucks. Um, yeah, I wasn't happy about it. Um, but I'm giving them the complex now. Is is that that's okay. counter? No, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, I just yeah. want to make sure. There's like, I have issues with that. Um, find a convenient time to try to fix why he was put on that. <laughs> Well, because he said that he's just like scattered yeah, all over the place, so but much. his job, I know his job is like very stressful too. So he feels like he's like, oh, wait yeah. a minute, I, I can't, it's too much. And so, so you shouldn't do an intake on him, but get his ass in the student clinic or something. Okay. Um, and let's see if we can figure out what's going on so that he can be more focused. Okay. And use the right herbs, but you know, fish oil, be complex, which wouldn't be wrong. Okay. Um, and maybe he won't need. Okay, I'm doing. Yeah. I'm I'm doing most of those. I didn't do the fish oil though. Okay. So I and don't be afraid of high dose. Okay. Like I usually, when I'm trying to work on ADD, ADHD, um, I'll usually start at at least three or four grams daily, and that might be broken up like two grams, two grams, two grams, or if it's like work related, three grams and three grams. Okay. And don't be afraid to go up from that. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. What is this? Before? Spotted horse mint. Yes, yeah, so it is a lemon ACA. Uh, it's a Florida native. It happens to be in bloom now, so it's beautiful. Uh, yeah. Any of you who are still here, ooh, ooh. it's oh. it's a little intense. It wow. has a little horse going on it. Wow. There's the spotted horseman. It's a beautiful, beautiful flower. Wow, that made my lips numb. Yeah, it, it's uh, a Look nice it. diaphoretic. Uh, it's a pretty flower. Yeah, it's the beautiful. The stem grows through the top of the neck. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's it's. That's if you get a cool. magnifying glass out, you can see the classic. Uh, yeah, the stem. <laughs> yeah, you'll see the classic uh, laminaceae flowers. And are what are there. they? What is this? Yeah, I use it for diaphoretic. Okay. Yeah, release exterior. Stem. Well, thank you for all your knowledge. All right, thank you all. I hope yeah. I see you at something else. Uh, I hope I see you in like open forums coming up in a couple of weeks, which is stump the herbalist. I don't know. Just send in lots of questions, and we'll talk about it endlessly for two hours, uh, whatever the last Friday of the month is. So it's coming up soon. Y'all have a great night. Bye. I'm gonna figure out how to stop this thing. Make it stop. Yeah. <laughs>